Welcome back everyone to Grand Tactician the Civil War as we continue our current campaign. It's December of 1861. I keep hoping that we're settling in for winter quarters, but there's a lot going on. Uh, we're sending the army of the Susquehanna over here to relieve this siege that's happening by these three Confederate armies on the Army of the Potomac. Uh, we want to just get our manpower up because right now the Army of the Potomac pretty much equal uh, in terms of manpower to the combined forces there. Uh, Winfield Scott's about to have his army uh, with the first perk available to them. Uh, we also have a supply issue out west with William Harney and the Department of the West. So we're going to pull him back uh, to the St. Louis Rolla um, Railroad Depot for now uh, just to ride out the winter so that we don't have any supply or food issues. Uh, army of the Mississippi under Grant I think is probably going to just sit tight for now. Uh, Department of the Ohio, same thing. Uh, the Army of the Kanawha, we, we've got kind of a nice line of defense right here that we can meet anything we need to with. We've got the Army of Indiana here uh, ready to kind of deal with any issues that prop up. They're just uh, a small reactionary force with uh, kind of a flying column. They, they can move quickly anywhere we need them to. Public Resolution 82 signed, uh, creating the Medal of Honor. Now, it gets a little tricky when you look at pictures from the Civil War because the Medal of Honor looked very, very similar to the GAR Medal. The GAR was the Grand Army of the Republic. It was like the post-war uh, version of the VFW. Uh, it was the fraternal organization for uh, veterans of the Civil War. And if you take this eagle and I think move it to the top, of this ribbon it basically looks the same as a GAR medal which you'll see in a lot of pictures but the first medals of honor were given to members of the Andrews Raiders uh, which is a story that I told over on vlogging through history um, men who went deep into the south uh, starting in Atlanta and working their way up toward Chattanooga tearing up railroads uh, quite a few of them were caught and hanged uh, and are buried in the Chattanooga National Cemetery. The survivors were the first recipients of the Medal of Honor. By the end of the war, a lot of people had received them. Uh, they kind of gave them out like candy because it was the first time they had anything like that. And uh, you could get a Medal of Honor for something as simple as uh, capturing a flag. Uh, I'm, I say simple, but that was a big deal at the time. Um, a lot of men received the Medal of Honor for that. And they went back in the 1890s, and there were a lot of new Medals of Honor that were given out. People like Dan Sickles, I think Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain got his then. Um, and then they also went back and subsequently revoked a lot of those Medals of Honor, including one that went to a woman uh, who had served as a doctor treating uh, wounded soldiers. But that was restored to her, I think, in the 1970s. Uh, so she is, to this day, the only woman who has received the Medal of Honor. Okay, so we actually did run into an army that was operating in the southern part of Indiana. The Army of Indiana is going to run up against that Army of Tennessee. Uh, it's a small fo force that we're going to be dealing with. We have all cavalry, 9,400 cavalry and 7 guns, going up against 6,400 infantry and 42 guns. This should be a rather interesting fight. Okay, so here's our battle map that we're fighting on. Another interesting one that I don't remember fighting on before. I'm sure maybe I have, but I just don't remember. The Battle of Paoli, Indiana. Uh, let's look at the numbers here. Uh, looks like we've got a slightly higher morale, which is to be expected fighting on friendly territory. We're going to send our cavalry down this way, uh, and then we'll just m slowly move up this way toward where I would expect that he'll, he'll be somewhere in this area. All right, we reached the end of the day. We had made it pretty close to where the enemy is going to be. Uh, so now we have a chance to redeploy. I'm just trying to look at the territory a little bit here. Cody's farm is right there, and I would guess that the enemy isn't far behind. We don't have the best weapons available to us uh, in these divisions. Uh, since this is a, a brand new army, they've got all basically the uh, mixed cavalry weapons, which are not the best. We've also only got six pounders for our artillery. Oh, we got a little bit of three inch ordnance, five guns worth right here. So it's a pretty poorly equipped force, but it was never meant to be kind of a main front line force in the first place. We gotta wait for our commanding officer, General Thomas Sherman to get up here. Uh, he may be way back here somewhere. So let's go ahead and bring this division around. 
and then we're going to slowly move up until we make contact. Okay, well we grabbed the first objective, no sign of him. Now we're grabbing the second objective and no sign of him. Uh, so I'm really not sure what he's up to, but now we're in a position where once we grab this objective, he's going to attack, have to attack us. So now we will get to be on the defensive and make him come to us. So we'll see what happens here. I'm going to start digging in. Okay, here they come. We spotted them over here, so that means I can probably expect they're all over there. So we're going to bring Alpheus Williams' division over to the right flank. These guys are already dismounted and ready to go. Again, not much range, so we're going to have to be careful here because he could park his infantry out of range of my small arms, and that could be a problem for me. Let's get these couple of three-inch ordnance rifles on this side. He's got a lot of artillery, too. We have to remember that. Yeah, see, he's going to start firing on me from a range that I can't fire back. So what we're going to have to do is charge into him. Now, what, I th what I'm thinking here is let's be a little aggressive. Oh, I can't issue brigade orders. I forgot. All right, mount up. And let's tell these guys to assault. And we'll hit this lead brigade before the other ones get there. Actually, I'm going to tell everybody to assault. Hit them. Let's send four cavalry brigades at this one infantry brigade of 1,900 men. Oh, really? Is he going to dismount? I want you to charge into those guys, man. Can I give a charge order to an entire division? Let's see. It looks like I cannot. All I can do is give a target order. I can't give charge orders. They'll have to do that on their own. Yeah, we're just going to have to be this aggressive. It's the only chance we've got, really. If it were infantry, I could sit back and just receive his attack. I can't do that with cavalry. They don't have the range. All right, we're going to tell Williams to go over and deal with this artillery before they get into position. I think these two brigades can handle the infantry. As you can see, more and more coming down this way. But look at all that artillery. We just cannot, cannot risk that at all. Starting to see the flaws in the system of having an all-cav unit. It works well to move around on the strategic map. But when you get into a battle against infantry, it just is not so good. What is he doing? Falling back. How are we doing on numbers here? Not good at all. 354 of our own casualties, only 85 of the enemy. Ugh. See, I need them to charge. That's the only chance we've got in a situation like this. I thought for sure giving an assault order would do the trick on that, but it's not. Alright, we're at least getting another brigade coming in on his flank. That should help. Not liking the odds on this, though. Morale's identical. Losses heavily favor him. This is a tough 
tough situation all the way along. Is my artillery even active? Yeah, the second battery's firing. What about the three inch ordnance? Yeah, they are too. Yeah, all cavs not gonna work. We're gonna have to mix in some infantry. Battles like this just have no chance with all cav because I can't fight defensively and I can't charge. And the men fall here. Not good. His artillery is opening up now. We're about to have some more of it over on our flank, and that is not going to be good. We're at almost 10% casualties already. What are these guys going to do here? Get on your horses and charge into them, guys. Come on. We don't even have repeaters, so maybe that would make a difference if we had better weapons. It would help even things out a little bit. Eleven hundred casualties to four hundred for him. send some infantry to help out with this. Once he sets these guns up back here, Burns is toast. That's what concerns me the most. Oh, okay. I think it's time to get out of here. We've got a real quick spot to with, withdraw to. I don't know why it's going to take 53 minutes, but we're pulling out. All right, we lost 2,500 men, only inflicting 900 casualties on the Confederates. A really, really rough day in southern Indiana, the Battle of Paoli. Going to have to send some infantry up there. I don't know if I should maybe detach a division from Grant's army and attach to these guys or if I should just send Grant up there. Uh, a few different options on how I can do that. Grant's got a pretty small force already. Maybe I'll send some of McClellan's men. And now we see that not only is the Army of Tennessee up here, but we've got some other Confederate units as well. Florida State Militia uh, and others. So I guess we are going to have to in fact send a major force up here to deal with that. We're going to send Grant, and we're going to send McClellan. McClellan's now got a perk. And uh, I think foot cavalry wouldn't be bad, flying column. But I'm thinking that going for supplies is going to be the way to go on all these western armies. So flying column it is. All right, we're going to send McClellan over to Louisville. And he'll be in position to help out when the time comes. Okay, so now we've got Winfield Scott's army, and he has um, a perk available. We're going to choose Ambulance Corps. I like the idea of being able to get those wounded soldiers back up and running. We've got three Confederate Corps against two Federal Corps. Uh, in this ongoing kind of skirmishing siege thing we have going on in northeastern Virginia. 
He's got Sappers and Miners 3, which is Siege Assault Efficiency Doubled, Embedded Reporters 1, Speed of Fame Development plus 25%. But all in all, I think we're in pretty good shape there, so I'm not too worried about that. Overall, 139, almost 140,000 men fielded for us, 96,000 for him. I think come spring, those numbers are going to go up substantially. Army of the Kanawha is about to take Charleston as we move toward the Clarksburg Depot. And now we're working on getting Department of the Ohio over to Louisville and Grant's army is, and everybody's really slow because it's winter movement, it's January of 62. Not really a time you wanna be moving your army out of a base of supply. But in this case, we really have to because he's operating in Union territory. Okay, we have uh, passed the Confiscation Act. This is something that happened historically. Uh, allows us to confiscate slaves, uh, call them contraband uh, as a war measure, take away that support for the Confederate economy. We're looking at a bit of a problem in terms of the economy right now. We're at BB minus on our credit rating, which is not good. So I think we're gonna go ahead and do print notes too. Grant's just about into position. I'm not a fan of the supply issue as it stands. It's really, really bad. Colonel Patrick's recovered. We're going to go ahead and hit these guys. Uh, the longer I sit here, the worse the supply situation is going to become. It's at 46% and, and falling fast. And there is supplies. Uh, there are supplies to be found right here. So, um, Who else? Colonel Patrick, Colonel Andrews recovered. 30,000 men. Uh, under Grant going up against uh, a force half their size, but I would guess better supplied, so it should be interesting. Okay, same battlefield we were just on in southern Indiana, but coming in from a different spot, and obviously with a very different force this time around. Uh, so we're going to get all of Grant's army in here between the rivers, uh, and then I think we're just going to push slowly forward right along this railroad and along this road here. And we're likely to hit him in one or both of those spots. But we outnumber him by enough that I, I can afford to split my army up a little bit. Maybe we'll send the Cav out. See if we can spot where he is. Well, that was completely unexpected. Jesse Reno ran smack into an entire division of Confederate infantry uh, and actually was able to surprise Armistead's brigade it appears uh, but I was not expecting to see him all the way down here I was just sitting here kind of eyeing where I thought he might be so we're gonna need to send support that direction as quickly as we possibly can and uh, we do have two divisions that are headed that way uh, so let's get McDowell heading there as quickly as possible he's gonna be tired but we're gonna get him on the double quick and then we've got Edward Baker's division that will go in next to him. We actually need to get them spread out into a single line. Meade is headed over this way. So we're going to start redeploying them. We'll hold Russell right where he is. And then we're going to send the majority of everything we've got. Because it appears the whole Confederate army is over here. In the meantime, Reno's got a nightmare on his hands as he is all by himself against the entire Confederate Army and out of range being fired on. He's just got to sit there and take it, basically, while we get everybody else in position. Let's get all the artillery up there, too. Okay, our lead elements are arriving. He's in parapets right here. I guess he was expecting me to come across this way. So the first East Tennessee Infantry are going to be the first to arrive. This is Edward Baker's division, followed by the Louisville Legion behind them. I don't know why they're going to line up right there, but that's absolutely not going to work. So let's shift them over this way. Let's get McDowell's division in behind them and to their right. Everybody else should be on their way. The artillery's not moving for some reason. 
Actually, this would be a perfect spot for the artillery right here. They won't have any infantry in their way and they'll have a perfect view of the enemy. Poor Jesse Reno. He's lost 400 men now. But he's buying time for me to get my army in position. So Buckeye Sharpshooters, 5th Michigan Volunteers, yes, we have Buckeyes and Wolverines in the same unit fighting together. I love it. I think they're in the same unit. Yeah, McDowell's division is the Buckeye Sharpshooters and the 5th Michigan Volunteers. We'll eventually add more to that. Maybe a new Iron Brigade of the West. Why are we lined up like this on top of each other? That's not going to work. McDowell, get your guys moved over. Reno, keep holding, buddy. Doing a good job. Here comes Robert Anderson's division in behind them. And I'm, I'm going to keep a pretty short line, I think, here. Actually, Anderson, let's maybe get you. No, that's not going to work. you got to go across right here. Can they cross right there? Yeah, that bridge is out, it appears. Reno's now lost almost 700 men, but he's still hanging on. He has probably not inflicted many casualties, though. Well, 300. That's not bad. Although some of that may be inflicted by these guys. Louisville Legion and the 1st East Tennessee Infantry have been firing for a while now. We're just trying to organize. We're having a hard time getting our battle lines drawn where we want them. It looks like they, the Confederates must have some men up here too because there's some parapets that have been drawn up here. So unless those were from earlier, he must have some men up there. So let's send Meade's division up there and see if we can get a look at what's happening. Have Baker send out skirmishers. McDowell as well. Looks like we broke Anderson. Nicely done. Here comes the artillery. Reno's about to break, but boy, he did an amazing job. Buying time for our army to get into position. And they did just that. So now we're going to have to push forward because we don't need him coming across the, the bridge and hitting our artillery. So let's go ahead and give attack orders to McDowell and Baker. Whose brigade is this? Or division is this? That's Anderson. Let's bring him in behind as a reserve. And then Meade's going to come up here on our right. We're going to have to hit this artillery before it becomes a problem. Let's push McDowell up to the railroad. First East Tennessee Infantry. Eastern Tennessee was very pro-Union during the war, even though it was in a Confederate state. Yeah, that artillery is going to become a problem if we don't deal with it. Come on, Baker, hit him. Not entirely sure what McDowell's doing at the moment. I wanted him to go up to that railroad. Let's make sure all the artillery is firing. Looks like it is. We've got 10 pounder parrots, Ward's battery. We've got Burnham's battery of 6 pounder field guns, and then 24 pounder howitzers up here. I'm rather inclined to move the howitzers and the 6 pounders up. No sign of any Confederates occupying these fortifications at this point. So that must have been an earlier position that he held. Come on guys, these guns are really concerning me. Baker, put your guys in long range. Gotta drive off those guns.
these 24 pounders could really wreak some havoc on Clark's division if they can get into him. I have nothing to protect these guys over here though. That concerns me a little bit. All right, I guess we can go ahead and bring Meade around now since there's nobody here. We're gonna keep Anderson's division in reserve. That's the Nordic Guards, the Lincoln Loyalists. And the Hurrying Hoosiers. Okay. Come on, 24 pounders. Beautiful. I don't expect this bat this battle is going to last too long. All right, Baker, assault. Let's push through, wreck that battery. And Meade's getting into position because I'm worried about these guns here. And Bernard B right there. All right, we drove off those guns. Let's push Baker up. Let's turn McDowell around. And then General Meade's gonna get in on the rebel flank over here. We've got a really good situation going now. Casualties have been relatively minor considering the size of the forces we're dealing with. Jesse Reno's 1st Cavalry withdrew. I'm not surprised by that at all. Buckeye sharpshooters. Can't sharpshoot when you're not firing long range, guys. So he's moving to counter Meade now. Let's give them long range orders. These guys here, and it's mixed muskets, River Valley Brigade. We gotta get their weapons upgraded. Blackhawk veterans have Springfields. You can see how much longer their range is than the mixed muskets. Meade send out some skirmishers. Ah, uh, he's retreating. To send out skirmishers to deal with these guns. Now we're going to start inflicting some major casualties. The numbers are pretty even at the moment. I have a feeling by the time this battle's over, they may not be since he's broken and retreating and we're pushing on him. We'll start to see those numbers climb a little bit. Okay, 977 casualties for us. Ended up with 1,300 for the Confederates, so not a real high number on either side, but the important thing is that Grant has driven the rebels, at least part of the rebels, out of Indiana. Hopefully they will push back across the Mississippi River if they're able, but we do have McClellan sitting over there in Louisville, so it may not be quite as simple as that. And interesting, he's actually got a navy over here, seven ships with 26 guns. That's actually rather comparable to my force, my Cairo squadron, which is uh, six ships and 28 guns. Firepower of 20. I can't see what his firepower is, but we've got ironclads. I'm not sure that that's what he's gonna have. So let's go take them on and see what happens. Get a little Navy action going here to wrap up this episode. It's going to take a while for them to get those orders and make their way up. Hartley Colliery disaster, coal mining accident in England. Hardly the only one of those that was happening at this time in history, unfortunately. All right, so they're fighting a rear guard action and taking some additional casualties. Um, here's the situation right now. Total casualties are actually a lot closer than I expected they would be, but you can see the battle's one difference at the moment. Um, I want to look real quick at Grant's army. 
in terms of weapons. Because we had a few that didn't have decent weapons yet. It's the River Valley Brigade. Here we go. We've got some Enfields. We actually got a bunch of Springfield rifle muskets available now too, so there's really no reason that we can't have everybody equipped with something decent. Get some carbines for the cavalry. And let's get those six pounders upgraded if we can. And we can. How about some three inch ordnance? So Grant's army's pretty well all upgraded now. Uh, I want to look at some of the smaller ones and see the same. All right, what's going on here? It seems like things are okay at the moment. That's that ongoing siege. We do have a supply alert, and that's the Army of the Kanawha. But they'll be okay once they get to the Clarksburg Depot. We really do need to try and settle in for the winter if possible. Okay, it looks like our naval battle is underway. I want to slow things down and take a look at it here. It doesn't appear to be going particularly well. Although our ships are in much better shape than his are, so maybe it's going better than it looks. The Battle of Louisville Ferry. It's a close distance fight, combat width of three. I guess we just wait and see how it unfolds. Glory, hallelujah, my eyes have seen the glory. Battle Hymn of the Republic. So that was written by Julia Ward Howe to the tune of another song, John Brown's Body. You know, there it is right there. It says music of John Brown's body. And it became one of the anthems of the North. Uh, it's got a lot of religious imagery, imagery in it, but it's also all about fighting for you know, freedom and things like that. The last verse talks about, uh, in the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me as he died to make men holy. Let us die to make men free while God is marching on. And uh, it became one of the rallying cries for the North. So it looks like the battle's going well. I guess, you know, down here, the, the victory balance is showing pretty heavily in our favor. Of course, having ironclad gunboats on both sides, you never know, but it looks like our ships are just in better shape. So in the end, it'll work out for us. The Army of Mississippi is preparing to lay siege at the Battle of Paoli. So Jubal Early is digging in here in Indiana. Grant's only got, he's got about 30,000 men. Not entirely sure how well this is going to go, but it appears to be going pretty well in our favor at the moment. We should probably get Grant some reinforcements, though. So I'm going to go ahead and send the Army of Indiana over there. They've got a lot of disabled right now. There, we've printed our new notes. That should hopefully help with the credit rating a little bit. Uh, let's go to finances now because we're going to raise our politics up so we can get an additional policy. Which I think is going to be, let's see, Diplomacy 3. That'll get us Whitworth's, Blakely rifles, and ironclad turret ships. Of course, Military 2 will allow us for armies. I don't know. Maybe Agriculture food exports. That might be something that comes in handy. So we'll send the Army of, the Tennis, er, of Indiana over there to help out with Grant's army in this siege. Hopefully drive them off. We're going to be getting into the spring here pretty soon. This naval battle is still going on. Did our Army of the Kanawha make it up to the supplies? It looks like they did. Let's upgrade that Clarksburg Depot. Start getting Richardson's army better supplied here. All right, so Grant's army's got a second perk available to him now. We've got Flying Column, which helps with supply. We're going to add Ambulance Corps uh, to help with those disabled. And as soon as this Indiana force gets into position, they are. They're now helping with the siege. That should go a long way. I don't know why we haven't finished this naval battle yet. I wonder if it's possible to get 
any additional units into that Cairo squadron. There's a few things we could send their way. It's going to take some time for that to happen. All right. With all of that said, we have not begun yet to move in toward the south. The Department of the West uh, under Harney is well supplied at the moment. But at some point, we've got to move him south and into Arkansas over there in that Trans-Mississippi Department. But we can't do any of that until we deal with these guys. I think we can probably start thinking about McClellan moving south uh, once we get into spring. We're going to probably primarily send him toward East Tennessee. We'll use Grant's army to move into Nashville. Uh, right here is the situation, 140,000 men fielded versus 100,000. Once I start to see his number go up, I can probably uh, think about recruiting a little bit more. I don't want, to, want it to be too ridiculously high. Um, we do have, I think, three or four patron units yet to recruit, and those are primarily because the states they were requested by don't have enough troops yet, but they will pretty soon. Uh, anytime you request a unit over on Patreon, I will I will hit the heart button and like it to let you know that that means I have recruited your unit. We'll be back in two days with the next episode. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. Please hit that like button. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.